Okay, so the passage we're reading this morning is from Matthew 11, and it's verses 25 to 30. Rest for the weary. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We thank God for his word. Thank you, Mark. I don't know about you guys, but I have been feeling weary lately. And so that has affected my choice in, in passage this morning. Because Jesus says in Matthew 11 here that he will give us rest. And so I thought about what does that mean? Because I've been feeling weary. I've been feeling tired of not being able to see the people I'm used to being able to see. Not being able to have parties or even potlucks here every month like we used to have. I'm tired of masks and regulations and hearing about case count increases. And I'm tired of bad news. I'm tired of election news and protest news. <laughs> I'm just tired. And maybe you are too. Because this has been a challenging time. And Jesus says he will give us rest. So what does that mean and how do we get that? And that's important to know because real rest comes from Jesus. It's at times like this when things are really hard for us in a lot of various ways that we might be able to actually appreciate that offer from him. Because when things are going really easy, then we don't really tend to care much about that offer from Jesus, right? Like we see that throughout, especially the Old Testament in the Bible. I think we can probably examine ourselves and see it in our lives. When things are going easy, things are coming easy, life is good, we don't stop and think, I need Jesus to give me a rest. We take that for granted. We sometimes take Jesus for granted. And so it's at times like this that we can really appreciate that he said, come to me and I will give you rest. So let's start with that beginning point there. Jesus gives us an invitation and I don't want to skim past that, that we have King of Kings, Lord of Lords that we worship. And he takes the time to give us an invitation that he cares about us, that he cares how we feel, that he cares whether we have rest. He's not like other rulers that we see around us. I feel pretty confident in saying if I went to go to Justin Trudeau's house, I would not be invited in and given a nice resting place and maybe some refreshments, I'm fairly confident I would not get past the gate. So Jesus, and that's not a shot at Trudeau, by the way, I'm pretty sure we'd say it about any world leader. <laughs> Jesus is able to do for us what other world leaders, what other leaders can't do. He can care about each one of us, and he extends that invitation. So let's not skip past that. But let's also notice that he makes it clear who in particular that offer is for. It's for people who feel burdened, people who feel, feel weary. So it's offered to those of us who recognize our own limitations, who realize we can't get through life easily on our own, that we need him. He offers it to people who feel broken and worn out. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. He gives it to people who recognize their need for him. And the burdens could include a number of different things. Those burdens can include burdens that are put on, us by, put on us by other people, burdens we put on ourselves, burdens of just life in general. So when I think about burdens that are put on us by other people, I think that's probably in particular, I mean, I'm sure he's applying it to all, but in particular, that's what Jesus is touching on here because in context and something we're gonna look at more next time, is he is speaking to a group of people in a time and a place where they are under a very difficult religious leadership. 
the Pharisees, who are made up of hypocrites. And these are people that are supposed to be giving God's law to the people, but instead they're giving God's law, but also a bunch of their own laws on top of it and weighing these people down. And Jesus describes the Pharisees this way later on in Matthew chapter 23, verse 3 and 4. He says about the Pharisees, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And I think all of us, all human beings, are very good at coming up with extra rules that we expect other people to live by for us to see them as good enough or see them as righteous. Instead of just giving people's God, giving people God's law. And so it's those kind of burdens that he will give us rest from. And some might even say, you know, in our culture around us, they might say, well, you feel burdened by all that because you're weighed down by that religious garbage. Just let go of all that and you'll, you, you won't have those burdens. But I think a quick glance around our culture tells us that's not true. You can go up to a group of atheists and talk to them and say, you think abortion is wrong and that the, that unborn baby is a living unborn baby. And I guarantee you will have broken a law in their mind, <laughs> a moral standard that they hold to. So our culture has its own standards that they try and burden people with and weigh people down with. And we also burden ourselves. I know I'm not the greatest preacher or pastor in the world. Yes, you are, Bill. You're amazing. Thank you. But, oh, thank you. That's, <laughs> but, <laughs> But I know I'm also probably the hardest person on myself, where there are times where there's this voice I hear in my head that says, you aren't fit to be a pastor, even though I've been doing it for 10 years and I was trained for it. And I see, and I mean, to some extent, I think we also have the discouragement of, of Satan in our ears sometimes trying to get us to stop so, uh, serving God. But, but I also see Beth, who's an amazing mom and takes amazing care of our house. And sometimes I'll come home and she literally rearranged all this heavy furniture in a room because she thinks it might be a better layout for the room. Yeah, I'm talking about you. You're out of the room. though. So <laughs> I was saying you're an amazing mom. It's okay. <laughs> but she's very hard on herself. And I'm sure we all do that to ourselves to some extent, one time or another. We lay burdens on ourselves, telling ourselves we're not good enough for God, even though he says that you are, if you've accepted his son as your savior. And Jesus can give us rest from those burdens and rest from burdens just in life in general. Things that we have no control over, things like the virus that's going around that we can't do much about. Things like people who are suffering because they've lost their jobs or there have been deaths in the family. Real suffering and real burdens. Jesus can give us rest from those too. And we see examples of this in the scriptures where People are going through difficulty, and God is with them. And we see it in the scriptures, of course, in very dramatic ways sometimes. So one of my favorite examples that I've given before, I'm going to do again because I love it, is the prophet Elijah. Cheap plug, by the way. Wednesday, we're covering Elijah in the Bible study. And the prophet Elijah, God did amazing miracles for Elijah. And he literally at one point goes from a, a mountaintop experience where God had done miracles for him and given him victory. And then he finds out the king and queen have basically put a price on his head. And suddenly he feels utterly defeated. Even though God had done all these amazing things for him before and protected his life before, something's different this time inside Elijah. And he goes into the wilderness and he collapses. And he basically says to God, just let me die. And God doesn't rebuke him for that or get angry at him for that. He could say, Elijah, what are you doing? I've done all these amazing things. What else do you want from me? Instead, God lets him rest. God miraculously gives him food sent by ravens to provide for him. And then when he's physically been rested, he gives him spiritual rejuvenation too. God appears to him first by showing him amazing miracles of power, what he can do. But then when he actually talks to Elijah, it says God talked to him as a small voice, like a whisper. And we see other times in the scriptures too. 
there's a, a story here. I like this picture of it. I should have been moving my slideshow. There we go. That's Daniel, an artist's depiction of what Daniel went through. So Daniel is serving in Babylon in an ungodly place where they worship false gods and idols. He's faithful to God. He's serving their, their leadership there well. And then he basically gets entrapped and unjustly is given the death sentence and he is thrown into the lion's den. Imagine yourself tumbling in. And you know there are lions there. He's there overnight, so you're there in the dark. There's nothing but feeling the presence of lions around, hearing them. Lions are terrifying. Have you ever seen videos of lions when they're attacking something? So imagine being back in one of those times where you don't have the kind of protections like we do now, where lions would easily rip you apart. Be, imagine being in that circumstance where you're surrounded, but God was with him. And I don't, it, the Bible doesn't describe exactly how Daniel reacted other than the fact that he was a man of great faith and that God defended him. But I love this depiction because it shows Daniel surrounded by lions, and he's literally got his back to them waiting to be let out. And that's funny and fitting to me because he, Daniel had great faith. He knew God was protecting him. Turning your back is the last thing that you do with a lion. There are videos you can look up online where there's people who go to a zoo and there's a glass barrier between you and a tiger. If you turn your back, tigers lunge at you. And that glass barrier is the only thing that saves you from getting horribly mauled. <laughs> but Daniel was protected by God. And what was meant by others as evil, God used for his own purposes. So then if Jesus is offering us this rest from our burdens, why does he talk about a yoke that we're supposed to take under ourselves, about taking his yoke on ourselves? So first of all, let's talk about what a yoke is because I can't, I, I can't take that word seriously. I think of the yellow part of an egg or someone mispronouncing joke. <laughs> this is an example of a yoke. Or here's another one. This is showing how it gets attached and they can carry drag wagons with it. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says. So Jesus makes us this offer, gives us an invitation, but we must come as disciples willing to learn, willing to be guided by him, not, not just receiving rest for nothing. There's a circumstance in which he is giving us that rest. When we come taking his burden upon ourselves instead, being willing to learn, being willing to follow him. So that restfulness Jesus is offering is not inactive. It's a restfulness of soul and body while we are serving him. So there's that condition or requirement. If we're going to take that offer, we have to come to learn. And I don't know, disciple is a term that we throw around sometimes. And our culture probably doesn't know a lot about what it means other than it's something religious. But it literally means to follow. And in Jesus' time and place, when he was using that word, the disciple was someone they would learn, but they would follow their teacher. And part of that learning would often be that they would serve that person. That was what you would do in exchange for the learning. You would serve the one learning you, or learning you, teaching you. <laughs> and so that's what we are supposed to do. It's like, have you ever had a day off work where you ended up sitting around and mostly watching TV or something like that? And at the end of the day, you just, instead of feeling rested, you feel kind of miserable because you look back over your day and you think, I could have done so much today. <laughs> sometimes days of just rest are good, but sometimes there are days when we rest when we should be doing something and we'd feel more rested if we did something. And that's what Jesus is talking about. When we think about Jesus, who's the one who is giving us this burden that we will take on ourselves, he says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And is there any better description of Jesus than he is gentle and he is humble? If you think of someone who had the ability to call down legions of angels to, if he wanted, violently defend him. <laughs> and we know angels are capable of that kind of combat if they need to be. Jesus could have done that, and yet he endured a life of mocking and ridicule and mobs and eventually, temporarily, dying from the cross. And Jesus didn't call down those angels to defend him. He was gentle, even with the people who were his enemies. <clears throat> and he is humble. 
Philippians 2 says Jesus is in very nature God, and yet he came to live as a human being, including all the humiliation that we tend to go through as human beings. He gave up paradise. He gave up so many of his royal privileges as creator of the literal universe so that he could serve us, so we could have salvation if we accept him as our savior. That is the definition of humility. And he says, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we started with this question, what does it mean when Jesus says he will give us rest? Because here's the thing, I've been a Christian for a long time, but my life is not a cakewalk. So was Jesus promising he was going to make everything just easy going and a picnic for us? Definitely not. If that was the promise, something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> that was not what he promised us. He was promising to be with us through those hard times. He was talking to people who were enduring religious leadership that was making their lives harder, not easier. They piled up moral law after moral law onto people, not God's laws. And they made it a burden. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to be that to you. I'm not going to be a hard burden. I'm not going to be a slave driver. I'm not going to whip you into serving me. My burden is light. Jesus says, I have a better way. I have a salvation that's given to you as a gift. How much easier can that be? I have a family I will welcome you into. I have a church you can be a part of. And yes, I have moral laws too, but they are ones you should strive to follow out of gratitude for salvation, not because you have to earn salvation through them. There's, uh, there was a missionary in the 1800s named John Patton, who has amazing stories. And I want to highlight one that I thought was probably the most interesting of them. So he's a, a missionary in the South Pacific to a place called the New Hebrides. And I'll be forthright and say, I don't know where that is. But I know it was a, an isolated small place. And I know that John Patton served there trying to bring the gospel of Jesus to people that back then in the 1800s, they would have called them savages. And he, to people who were literal cannibals. And so he, record, he wrote down what his life was like as he was among these people. And eventually he had great success bringing them the gospel. But there were times where he would come out of his house because he heard people outside and his house was literally surrounded by people threatening to kill him. And this is the story that I thought was the most amazing of them. There was a time where he was being chased literally by hundreds of people armed with knives and it's the 1800s, so muskets. <laughs> These tribes people had gotten muskets at the time. And they were trying to find him and kill him. And he had one person who was offering to help him. And he didn't know if he could even trust this person. But the guy told him, climb up in the tree. And when they come, I'll say you went by. And so with no other options, that's what he did. And he clung to that tree. Clung to a branch. And this is what he wrote years later about that experience. He said, I climbed into the tree and was left there alone in the bush. The hours I spent there live all before me as if it were out of yesterday. I heard the frequent discharge of muskets and the yells of the savages, yet I sat there among the branches as safe in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul than when the moonlight flickered among those chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus. Alone yet not alone, if it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree, to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. And then he closes with this to his readers, and pass, I'll pass on to all of us. He says, if thus thrown back upon your own soul, all alone in midnight in the bush, in the very embrace of death itself, do you have a friend who will not fail you then? And that is, to me, very touching. And that's the kind of rest Jesus offers. Not to take us out of the difficult circumstances or to give us no work that we have to do. But he is the other half of that yoke, and he's carrying it with us. He's there with us going through the difficulties. And so here many of us are, 
not nearly in dramatic as, circumstance, as dramatic as circumstances John Patton, but we are in difficult circumstances. And as we cling to this tree, we have to rely on Jesus. We are to focus on the one who can give us real rest. Jesus says to come to him, and he means it. Come with your sins and your failings. Come with your doubts and your weaknesses. Come broken and weary. Come exhausted. Pray to him, listen to him, obey him, trust in him, and Jesus will give you rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not a God of the kind that we read about in myths and stories who are distant, don't really care about mankind, or the gods of some other religions or, or even our human leaders who can just see us as tools, but Lord, that you are a God who genuinely cares about each one of us, who offers to be with us, to give us rest, even in our difficult circumstances. And Lord, I know that people maybe here or who are watching some of our regular tenders who might be watching this video later are going through a lot of difficulties, have, some have lost jobs, some have had deaths in their families. Lord, I pray that you would help us not just to try and shut things out, not just to try and block ourselves off emotionally from those pains, but Lord, that you would help us to instead turn to you, to give you the time that you deserve. Through prayer, we know that you will also give us rest. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.